think every relationship will really have a moment where you're gonna hit a crossroads and you have to decide in that moment, am I really in this? We fight every day, okay? We have disagreements, whatever. Disagreements. We have disagreements. Fight, shoot, I mean, everyone has their death. There it is right there. See, that's the disagreement and fight right there about the word, that's it. When we get an argument, it's like wow, chaos and we're just wiping everything off. I used to think like, oh, I can never talk about divorce. But then I started resenting that concept. I was like, well, then I'm, I'm aged. And I begin hating her because I can't talk about this thing that has legitimately crossed my mind. We've worked so hard on our relationship. We basically wrote our own language in our relationship. Whereas before, I was taking my family's language and she was bringing her family's language into this relationship. When I realized like, hey, we gotta, we gotta wipe everything out and we gotta build our own language of respect, love, fun. Hi, and welcome back to the Blue Morpho podcast. I'm your host, Hamilton Souther. And today I have the honor of sitting with Davis and Sydney, who told me just recently that they are in Ibiza. And uh, I got the, the joy of meeting these incredible people on one of my own retreats at Blue Morpho. And um, since then, I've been following them on Instagram. And it's been amazing to understand this variety of life and lifestyle and job that you guys have created. So Thank you guys so much for being on oh, the podcast. Thanks, Hamilton. It's good to see you again. Uh, ever since we left our Aya retreat, we've been thinking about you uh, quite a bit, and we've thought about that experience a lot, and it's something that we talk about and refer back to almost weekly. Yeah, honestly, Davis and I are always talking about it and chatting about it, so we're excited to be on here and speak with you again. Thanks. I want to get into like what it's been like uh, since then, but I also want to go into some of the places you guys have been. So since, you know, in the last months, where are all the different places you guys have, have visited and, and how do you get to do this? Like, how does this, how, who's how does allowing this us to do this? Yeah. That's... So I guess, um, if we were to talk about for just 2023, we started out the year going to Australia and we jumped around there for about two months and we went all around the country really the east coast west coast the middle then we went back to los angeles which is kind of what we call our home base it's where we have our storage unit um and then we for the past month we've been in europe in italy and we're in spain right now but the reason that we kind of jump around to all those places is we are photographers so travel photographers we do we shoot I guess photos we create content for a lot of hospitality accommodations so whether it's a luxury airbnb or villa or a very high-end hotel or resort we create content for them that they use in their own marketing and then we also are shooting for like fashion whether it be shoes belts backpacks uh, i mean literally anything we're in so many different exotic destinations that it's it's an affordable option for these brands instead of them having to hire a whole team and fly them out to a specific place we just say hey we're going to australia we're going to be there for the next two months we're going to be in these types of locations and we'll put together kind of like a mood board of what we think would fit for their brand and then we pitch to a few brands to see if they want to be on the, uh, to be showcased on that trip and so we do the photography side of it and then we also have our social media where we are kind of working with different brands showcasing our photography work and we've been doing all of that off and on for let's see we started four years ago full time full time the first year was kind of a little mix of we had just kind of started our page as a showcase for photography and then it blossomed into a full-on business and then for the past three years we have been full-time on the road that's incredible i the first time i heard about it i was like wait what how, how is this all coming together and i have to say i've been fanning on the uh on the instagram so i look at like the photos and the art that you guys create is oh, fantastic you. so the, the quality is is certainly there and uh yeah, it's captivating. It really is. It's it's absolutely beautiful. Where on the trip to Australia, like where were some of like the highlights or favorite places you went? Where would you recommend for people to go and visit? You know, 
what kind of unfolds? So it's interesting. The way we're traveling now is very different than how we traveled when we had our our other jobs. We had jobs before this. We we worked in offices and we were pretty tied to the desk. But now we we do kind of the slower travel where we'll stay for a week or so at a time in a specific location. And so then we can really kind of lean into the local community, shop with the locals, be with the people, kind of understand like, oh, where where does where do they go for coffee? Instead of if we just had two days there, which is really just one day because you're packing to you're unpacking when you arrive and then you got to pack the day you leave. And so transit days take up a lot of time too. But we we've taken on this slower travel mentality. And being in Australia for that amount of time, the first place we arrived, mind you, we are coming out of Los Angeles where it was pretty rainy in January this year. And it was very kind of gloomy, overcast. And we get there and we stayed at a place called Bondi Beach, which is like the hip hop happening place of Sydney, which we didn't, we knew it was cool, but we didn't know it was that cool. And it's that's <laughs> absolutely stunning. The beaches there are just bright turquoise, white sand. And they've got this really cool concept that I think they should have all over the world where they have take these um, like rock pools by the side of the ocean where they'll carve out a pool that people can swim in. And it's you have the ocean splashing into it. It's really they got like swimming lanes. And so like it's like the, the local community pool is yeah. on, on the ocean. So that is that is a place we would highly recommend. And that. For some reason, when we were there, it was like a Saturday. Everyone that was out there was just like 10 out of 10. Really good looking people. Everyone was tan. Everyone was just like shredded. And we're everyone walking down. We're like, so how's, how's, what is this place? Like, it was like Los Angeles 2.0 is what we, we joke about it. California, Southern California yeah. 2.0. But we loved Australia. Um, definitely would recommend Sydney. We also went up to the Wit Sundays, mm. which looks like the Maldives are a tropical paradise, but it's a part of Australia, which was amazing. Um, the West Coast too, I think it's a whole different vibe over there. The East Coast, there's a lot of really fun cafes and coffee shops and the towns are built up. And on the West Coast, it's a bit more sparse, sparse. but the beaches are just magnificent. We had kangaroos come up to us on one of the beaches, which was insane. That was wild. That was just wild. Um, so as you can tell, we, we, we liked the coast. We were at a lot of the beaches in Australia. That's usually where we spend a lot of time. But then we went to the center where they have the, the big rock. That's kind of the iconic place. It's called Uluru, which was, which was very interesting to experience that in person. Cause I've always seen it in movies and cartoons and finally to be there in person and see just how big it is and the power of it. It was, yeah, it was pretty grounding. Um, but we were, we were out there for a long enough time where it was kind of like, all right, I think it's, it's time to come back and kind of regroup. And that's the thing. We don't, we're not going to stay somewhere for six months, of course, because our visa only lasts a certain amount of time. But you know, this this lifestyle allows us to then go and get a new terrain that we can pitch to brands and say like, hey, we're going to go to, to the Amalfi Coast now, which is different than East Eastern Australia, right? And so that was, and it would also is really fun to be in these these remote parts of the world and especially Australia because everyone speaks English. And getting an understanding of like these people live here and they have lived here for a very long time. Like our Airbnb hosts, like they haven't left Australia for 50 years. And so having appreciation that, wow, we get to travel like this is incredible. And something else, as Davis mentioned, we do travel slower. And part of it is because it's out of necessity. When we first started this job, we were just going place to place to place to place, stacking up our schedule, thinking, wow, we're going to be so efficient. We'll do two days here, two days here. We're going to work and just like scheduling in all of our projects. And we completely burned ourselves out for the first six months. So we had to figure out a way to make it sustainable because for anybody who's ever taken a big trip and traveled, sometimes it feels like you need a vacation after your vacation <laughs> because you spend so much time and so much energy and it's so fun and exhilarating, but you can only run off of adrenaline for so long. There's traveling and, and there's vacation. And so it's two different things. We had to really figure out how we could make it sustainable and be able to go places. And so we'll have to section in to say, okay, we're going to have shoot days and days we're going to explore. And then we also have to have work days, down days. We're doing emails, we're getting caught up on things. And then also just 
mental health refreshers and being able to have kind of the daily routines that you need to have to keep yourself grounded because yeah like I said the first six months that we were going all out traveling we were it was crazy we we literally went off of adrenaline for six months yeah and then we crashed <laughs> so we hard. crashed pretty hard <laughs> Yeah. And so we, that some small adjustments, I mean, they're not small, but they're big. They made a big difference for us. One was renting a car, getting a car, getting your own vehicle, instead of having to depend on buses or trains to get everywhere. Um, having, for the most part. I mean, when we were to Amalfi, we had to, you know, take a train and do the boat thing. But we're here in Ibiza, sense. we have a car. In Australia, we always had a car. We always rented a car. And then mm -hmm. being able to have a, a space with a kitchen. So we could cook our own meals where we're not dependent on having to do restaurant research all the time because we have a specific diet that we follow. So we like to go out to restaurants, but it can just, again, take a lot of time and energy when you're going out every day and that's your life. It's fun when you're on, again, for like vacation a week, for a week you know, but... to go try restaurants. <laughs> but a lot of times we'll say like, hey, let's go out one or two nights, but then to still be able to have like a routine of making some of your own meals and just having down days. And we have a we have a workout set that we got from uh, my brother in law is a personal trainer. He gave us a set of workouts that we can do, and so we travel with workout bands. Which I never, to be real, I never thought workout bands were a thing. I was like, yeah, okay, this doesn't work. But he got us on this program, and dude is working, and we're we're definitely feeling good, and we're in a routine where we're working out consistently every week, and we feel good. But also in order to be able to travel and stay healthy, I mean, you have to take care of your body because traveling is hard mm -hmm. and we can't afford to have sick days because a lot of times, especially when we're working for a client, if it's a hotel client, we've got two, three days on site and we need to be at, you know, peak performance where we, our mind is on, like our bodies healthy and strong to be able to take us through the day and we need to be able to perform well on those three days because we don't have a week we only have that time and if we're sick because we haven't taken the time to take care of ourselves then then we're in we're in trouble, <laughs> we're in trouble. <laughs> we end up leaving a property without any content we have not found ourselves in that situation no. to this day we always have something that we can we can provide that we feel good about so no it's amazing i was gonna say like you know you're traveling and you got it. Everything's new. It's constantly new. And I wondered how you actually deal with that idea of routine and just finding comfort and groundedness constantly on the move. Yeah, that's a it's an interesting concept because we so we've been married for a while now. We got married when we were 21 and 23. So we were babies. We were babies when we got married. And this expectation that we had around what a nuclear family should look like and where we should be at this point in our life with family, children, job, um, we kind of, all those expectations got morphed and we had to redefine those things over the last couple of years. And that has allowed us to kind of establish a new normal with this travel lifestyle. So we don't, like our families, they know what we do, but I don't know if they really, like no one really understands what we do and we're okay with that. Before I wasn't okay with it. I wanted people to understand like, hey, this is where I'm going. This is why this is hard. But in reality, they, they're not going to be able to understand it. And so we're like, okay, this is our new normal. Are we okay with that? If not, what do we change to make it so that we're okay with it? Because we don't, we don't have an apartment we come back to. We're, we're literally in Airbnbs all the time. And, unless we're staying and working with hotels. Unless we're staying at a hotel. And this living out of a suitcase lifestyle is not for everybody. And we had to just accept that, hey, that's it's for us right now. And we're okay with that. I think there are also certain things that we can do that have made it an easier transition because we're definitely not backpackers. I mean, no. I can't live out of a backpack. And so having our storage unit in LA is absolutely essential. Right. So we'll go out for typically about a month, month and a half. Australia was long. It was two months. And that was kind of pushing it in terms of how long we like to go out before we come back, because, you know, we'll pack and we'll plan for a trip. And then we do go back to our storage unit where we can change things out. We still have some of our 
you know, tools, equipment, props. And so it doesn't feel like we have to have everything we own in a backpack yeah. with us. We did that. When we first got married, we did a, the Asian yeah. backpacking circuit and we did that for a month and we did it like the real, real budget travel, which was fun. Life, life experience for sure was awesome. Um, but now we, we travel with nice clothes. We like to look good when we go out to dinner because that's part of our brand. That's what we're offering to clients. But the other thing too is there are things on the daily that we like to do and I definitely notice when life gets busier and some of these things start to fall out that it it doesn't serve us. So we do like to work out like three to four times a week or just, you know, move the body in some way, just kind of like get the energy flowing. Um, we have a gratitude practice. We have a gratitude practice that we do every day where we'll say three things that we're grateful for, three good things that happen in the day, one grounding truth for us at the moment, um, something that we are manifesting or putting intention towards, and then something that we appreciate about the other person. And we do that every day. And so that that's home for us. Mm-hmm. We have that just little things, right? We Before we had a house full of plants and we had two cars and we were going to get a dog and we had all this these plans to just like get really rooted into that geographic location. But this now has become like a home is where the, what do they say? Home is where the heart is. But it's really just like home is wherever you're comfortable with it being. <laughs> if you want it to be in Iquitos, if you want it to be in Ibiza for the time being, then we're, we're going to have it in Ibiza and then we're going to move it to the south of France next. And then who knows after that, right? Like we can take it wherever we want. And that, that had to be a thing that we just agreed with being okay with. Because if, if she was okay with it and I wasn't, then we're in, is a little bit of a clash. And so we had, never, we had that early on because I didn't want to travel like this as much as we are. At first I was scared. It's because I was scared, <laughs> but here we are and it's fun. What was scary about it? That's really Ooh, interesting. I was scared of leaving the track that I was on. I was on a good track, Hamilton. I had a good job. I had worked hard for it. And I saw the path like 10, 20 years going ahead. I knew where that was going to end up. And there was comfort in the known rather than the unknown, right? Mm-hmm. And I And I was doing therapy and I would kind of like started to shake up my snow globe of of understanding everything had kind of settled, but I didn't realize it had settled. And once it started to shake and then it just started to become more and more shook up and then ayahuasca showed up and then it just became this whole circus of living in the mystery and the unknown at all times. And that's, and I'm like grasping for, (laughs) for something I can rely on and like be safe with, but I'm realizing that the safety comes in the surrender. I would say too that, um, I think that typically for our two personalities, Davis will tend to cling to the comfort and to the routine more. And I am definitely a little bit more of a rebel and kind of shaking things up. So I was the one kind of saying, hey, life could be different. What if we did this? Or what if we tried something new? And so it took, it was about a year of me just slowly, very subtly saying, Hey, we could do this full time. You know, she was casting spells. I was just, it wasn't black. I was just offering the option (laughs) that this could be a really fun life for us to live because I had quit my job first. So I guess if we backtrack, um, when we graduated from university, we were married and I was a chemical engineer and Davis was an opera major. And I had a full-time corporate job and he also had a full-time job. And we were just kind of like in that lane, in that track, just moving along. Again, we could see the 401k down 20 years, right? But you know what made that so comfortable was that we had reinforcement from everyone in our immediate circle of interaction. So within Mm -hmm. our church community, within our families, within our offices, Everyone is looking at what we were doing individually and saying, good job, stay the course, you're doing the right thing. And we're like, yes, we're doing the right thing. Look (laughs) at us, we're doing the right thing. And so we're like, we move here, we're doing the right thing. And everyone is saying, yeah, oh, that's the right thing. That's the right thing. And that is what I was afraid to get out of because this was not the right thing Mm. to just say, hey, we're just going to leave now. 
<laughs> so, so then it was, I had a couple of sleepless nights where I, I really, I would stay awake laying there thinking if in 10 years I am still doing this same job, I'm going to look back at my life and think, what the hell did I do with it? Why? Because I didn't really care about my job. I did it because I, I was kind of chasing success. And to be honest, I went to the uh, company that I worked for because they were the top internship company at our school. So when they were doing interviews, right, they were seen as the absolute top of the top. And so I wanted to go to the top. And so that's where I interviewed with them. I got my internship and then I got a job with them. And then I was always just going for how can I gun to be, you know, at the top, at the top, at the top. And I was climbing the ladder, climbing the ladder. And then as I was climbing, I was kind of looking down, like, what, what am I doing? I don't really care about this. What is this all for? But you had insurance. <laughs> so, you had a 401k. And it I, was so good. And I, re I remember one, of, one time my boss said, so look at all of the people up above you and who whose career path would you like to emulate? And I just had this fear. And I said, I don't want any of that. I don't want to end up like you anyone. Said, you said that to their no, face. I didn't say that to their face. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I respectfully said I'll have to think on that. Um, but that's <laughs> very polite of you. Was... You're in the middle of like an existential crisis. None look good. Oh, I'll be very polite about back that. Um, I'll circle back. You know, corporate speak. Yeah, no, I was exactly. very politically correct. Yeah, um, she handled it. But yeah, and that's when I. I literally, I stepped away. It was two months later that I, I went into my boss's office and I just said, uh, I quit. I'm, this is my two weeks notice. And I've never seen a more shocked face because she had literally just given me a promotion. But I was just, I was done. I, I just said, this life is not wow. for me. And it was, I, just, I was a deep knowing that I had in my It was a rough soul. rough time though. Cause yeah. you were traveling a lot. You were gone a lot. Yeah. And then there was this It was whole, very grueling. It was honestly, <laughs> for me, it was emasculating because I was the stay at, I was the one who was staying in, we were in Houston at the time. I was the one staying in Houston and she was the one getting on flights and going out and doing her thing. And I was, I was selling shopping centers as a broke. I was a real estate broker for commercial properties. And I stayed in Houston and it's like for commercial real estate it can be very localized. And so I was feeling like, well, I should be the one traveling. I'm the male. I need to go do this thing. And she's just like, hey, I'm out. I'm going to New York. Oh, I'm going to Chicago. I'll see you there. I'm in Montreal. And I'm just like, what? What is going on here? And then we just we just didn't see each other. At yeah. that point, we've been married for five years. And we were just like, who are you? Like, what are, what are we doing? What are we doing here? Well, and it was, it was very interesting because I got to really taste how unsatisfying it is to have that type of success where – you look at it, especially in, in college, you think, wow, that's the life. That's the dream. But, you know, I got to the point where I was I was a marketing manager over all of North America at a very young age, which is why I was having to travel because my whole um, territory was all of North America, which is the U.S. and Canada. But it was so empty and it just it wasn't fulfilling. And I it was just a deep knowing that it wasn't for me. And so I quit, had no idea what I was going to do, had zero intentions around it. And that was when I said, you know what? I've always wanted to learn photography. We love to travel. I will take this nice camera on our trips and I have no idea how to use it. I don't know what any of these buttons mean. And so I am going to take some time and actually read the manuals that I had bought to learn it. <laughs> and I'm going to learn how to do photography and be able to edit some of these nice photos that we have from these travels because traveling was really the one thing that was like still bringing us together in a time that we could enjoy each other and really ground us because we were separated from our other jobs. And so started to learn photography. And then that's when we started our Instagram as a place to showcase photography and it blossomed into our careers. But um, yeah, it was, it was definitely something 
wasn't planned for, but it yeah. evolves. We didn't graduate with this in mind for <laughs> sure. But we had also in that time we worked for probably, yeah, enough five, six years in corporate, which was long for enough you, yeah. for me. Yeah. You, you checked out about four, which is longer than one or two years. Right. Where I feel like we were in it long enough to get promotions, to feel the success and be like, you know what, if we ever need to come back to this, then we could. We have the skill set where we could we could plug back into this network. We know enough people. We've made enough money doing it. We're like, okay, we know the flow of this business. Versus right out of college when you don't really know how adulting works. You're still kind of figuring that out. Like, what does it mean to be an adult? How does this work? And then we also we started doing therapy at that point too when you quit your job. Mm-hmm. We did couples therapy for two years, which that sh- with the job shift and then COVID happened and then I left my job and then we were traveling full time, which was a very interesting time to be traveling the world because everyone was on lockdown, but there was a huge need for these countries that survived on tourism and everyone had different rules of how to get in and out of the country. And for these super touristic, heavy focused countries, they were struggling big time. And so we ended up being kind of the tip of the spear for a lot of these travel agencies and showing people how to get to places. Like when Tahiti opened back up, we were probably the second flight to Tahiti from Los Angeles. And so we show people, hey, this is how you do it. There's a lot of hoops we have to jump through in order to make sure everything stays safe. It's how they called it then, right? But that was an interesting shift for us because I think previous to that, a lot of our page had been very photography heavy. But then at that point, a lot of tourism boards and hotels are very interested in the social media aspect of how we could share how, how to get there, what to do, what is the protocol and what are, what is everybody doing to make sure that you can still travel safely and so yeah, it was a very interesting time that our business was actually growing a lot during COVID, which seemingly on paper would have been the worst time to jump into a travel business. <laughs> to but, quit my job. Um, yeah, that it was, was right for us. <laughs> that was when, yeah, because it was that summer. I remember I sat down and I was just like, hey, I've got to take this chance. Because I someone that I respect and go to to seek advice from me. I was talking to him one day. I was like, man, I don't know what to do because like we have this opportunity to potentially go and like go after this travel thing, but I've got all these clients in real estate and I've got a good thing going. And he's like, man, if you could leave for 12 months and come back to the exact same spot that you are, have the same amount of money in the bank account, would you do it? And that was the biggest question to me of like, do you have the guts and the courage to go after something that you're afraid to do? Because I was, that was very scary for me and the, probably the first time that I would be really breaking out of a mold that I had been become comfortable in. And I, I'd, I didn't have any other answer. Then I was like, well, of course. Like, why would I not give something a shot? I know I would regret it. And so that's when I went in and I told my partner, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a different direction now. That was the happiest day of my life. She was excited. <laughs> and then two weeks later, we were on a flight to Turkey. And we did the Turkish coast and Greece. And so we were all over the place after that. But That's an that's an amazing story. Like truly amazing. Since that started, like where are your favorite places to go? What what has stood out for you as just um, like truly the I don't know, most notable? Like you didn't Going there was the most surprise of how incredible it was. Oh. I'll go first. Okay, yeah, you go first. The Maldives. The Maldives is heaven on earth. There is no place like it. The reason being you have a combination of Asian hospitality, which is top. And then to get anywhere, you have to take a seaplane. And I've never really been in the seaplane operation before. And the way that this the Maldives functions, they have over 150, 160 islands. Each one has its own luxury resort and they have this huge system. The largest fleet of seaplanes in the world is moving people around all of these islands every single day. And so you arrive to this island nation, which is just southwest of India, to give you an idea of where it is. And it's warm water, just turquoise blue. And then you get in the seaplane and they take you to your luxury resort. And so we're shooting for three, four luxury resorts at a time on a trip to the Maldives. So we'll go for a month 
and you're taking seaplanes to these five-star resorts. And then we get to sit there and experience this five-star luxury while we're capturing it on camera. And this is the thing that I'm grateful for with our work is that we have a reason to be in these places. It, it's different if we were vacationing there because I, I believe I would get bored if I would just arrive and I'd be like, okay, well, I've done all the activities. Now what am I doing? You're sitting next on the days? beach for a month. Yeah. It's, it's like, hard. okay, so I got tan, you know, but yeah. for, as a photographer, we show up and it's like, how do we capture this place in a way that is intriguing and it, it, it sparks interest in people who haven't been here before. And so we're on this, it's like a mission driven adventure. And so we get to go to these beautiful islands and we're hopping around. It's basically like, it's straight up paradise. It's every screensaver that I ever saw growing up was Maldives. And so to take a pause, when Davis says seaplane, what that means is that you literally land on the water. So you take off and you land the plane and it lands on the water and then you deboard onto a dock and then they boat you into the resort. So it's, it's a insane experience. <laughs> nothing like I've ever experienced. But in, in the time that we're in the Maldives, as Davis was saying, it's visual storytelling, which is, again, it's a puzzle. It is something of interest that we're constantly trying to ask ourselves and try to push ourselves to say, how can we, sh what is the most unique aspect of this place? How can we find the most interesting, the most artistic angles to really tell the story of why this place is so unique and beautiful? Because a lot of place, every place that you go is different and is absolutely amazing and it is our job to showcase the uniqueness of it and so it's always we're always trying to push ourselves and challenge ourselves of how can we make it just a little bit more magical and a little bit better at capturing that which is different than as Ava said if we were just there to experience to it and experience sit on it. sit on the beach which would be nice but I think we'd get bored after a couple of days where's your favorite place my favorite place Oh, it's hard. Um, I honestly feel so at home anywhere along the Mediterranean. So that is Italy, south of France, and Greece. There's something about it where every time we come, I feel so inspired and it just feels like home. For our photography, there's just these old historic towns and most of these coasts you just have all these houses that are just built up onto the coastline you've got sapphire water you've got these really cool beach clubs all these interesting angles and the i don't know in all these places the europeans they just take the time to really make it so nice and so special and every pocket is just this immaculately designed thing that i I don't know. Every time I come, I just get this huge smile on my face. And even though a lot of times traveling in Europe can be a little bit more tricky because of the trains or the buses or it's really small roads or it's more crowded, I just have this big smile on my face every time that we are along the Mediterranean. European summer. European summer. I just, I love. Growing up, I Americans, maybe we, we look at Europe and we kind of glorify the European lifestyle and Europeans maybe look at America and think, oh, New York, LA, so yeah, cool, Hollywood. But it's the European summer thing is not something that I think a lot of Americans get to experience because it's, I mean, you can get there, but usually they'll go to Rome mm -hmm. and then they'll do Colosseum. But to get to the coast, it's an extra step. And if you're going to go out for a week or 10 days, chances are you're not going to make it to the coast. And so it stays pretty European which is fun for us because we don't hear English speakers that much in the time that we're along this Mediterranean area. And that's, ugh, it's so beautiful. I would say if I had to choose my favorites, so for anybody kind of like looking for the best places along the Mediterranean, I would say the Amalfi Coast in Italy or Portofino are two amazing little coastlines of Italy. Um, in south of France, Saint-Tropez or Monaco are both stunning. And then in Greece, the island of Milos is one that will forever live in my... For photographers, for photographers heaven. it's a heaven. Also, the island of Paros is so cute and picturesque. Just because they're trying to be unique. Santorini is hands down like you have to go to Santorini. 
So that yeah. one's incredible. Those are places that we love. We could go on and on. Ibiza's <laughs> great. We're here now. We're we're already talking about how we can come back here and Yeah, we already it. want to come back. We're already planning to come we're back again. Planning to figure it out. In terms of the creative process and trying to uniquely capture a place, what kind of what are your steps? What process do you go through when you arrive and, and start to check it out? How does how do you get those angles and how do you fully conceptualize the storytelling you so, want to do? As soon as we arrive to any hotel or destination, the first thing that we will do is we will literally drop our bags. We take a phone and we take a camera and we will walk the entire property. So we will walk and explore all the aspects, but we're not actually going to be shooting any of the content that we will be providing to our clients. But we're just getting a grasp of what is possible here. And so we walk the property, we look at all the different angles, and we actually have an app that allows us to know where the sun will be at all times of the day because certain, certain locations will look better with the sun shining directly above you or maybe behind you or um, to just, I guess, in a simplified term, where the sun is will make a difference for how we want to shoot a certain spot. So we'll walk around the property. We'll have our app out looking to see where the sun will be at different times of the day for different spots. And we'll kind of make a plan to say, okay, we want to shoot all of these things in the morning. And then we want to shoot these midday. And then we want to shoot this at sunset or late afternoon. And then we'll think about the outfits that we want to do to say, for the hotel, we want to shoot and make sure that we get X, Y, and Z photos. We want to make sure that it looks nice here. We'll probably try to color coordinate it. So if the hotel has certain colors that they have in their marketing, we'll try to make sure that we are incorporating those either into our outfits or into maybe some of the props. If we'll have like a, a bag or an accessory, like we're always trying to keep that in mind so that we can showcase the property and the best way possible. Um, and then after that, we'll make a priority list to say, okay, so we've talked about all of these shots. If we could only get three shots, what are our top three? If we could only get five shots, what are our top five? Because weather doesn't always cooperate. And so if weather isn't cooperating, what are the things that we have to have? What are the things that are nice to have? And what are the things that are just kind of like the cherry on top of the cake if we can get? Um, and then we'll also look for brands that we're shooting for. So if we're shooting for a clothing brand, then we'll look to see, are there any spaces on this property that would make sense for shooting that clothing brand or product that would be a nice stylized shoot? And we'll try to plan that and think about the times of day for that. So it's kind of all a big giant puzzle piece that we try to wrap our arms around within the first couple of hours on entering site. And then from there, because sometimes it's two nights, sometimes it's three nights. We usually don't do less than two nights because mm -hmm. it's not enough time. With the variability in weather, you just can't. You can't get done what they, what they want. And so we usually also have a brief where we've sat, sat down with the marketing person for the hotel or the brand that we're shooting for. And we have an idea of what they're looking for. And at this point with our skill set, we know what we're capable of doing and we're pretty efficient. Like we can get a lot done with an hour of sunlight. Like we've, we only had, we only had two hours of sun on this last trip in the Amalfi. Like it's, it was raining the whole time. And we're staying at probably the nicest hotel we've stayed at ever and it was raining the whole time so we were really sad about that but then when the sun came out we're just like okay this 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 and the sun actually didn't come all the way out it kind of it was like a light drizzle and it was a bummer because it was one of the coolest beach clubs <sighs> survived but they it was during kind of a hurricane and so they couldn't even put out the umbrellas they hurricane that's a big <laughs> hurricane there was a lot that's there was a lot of rain and wind. I don't know if it's a hurricane. That was kind of, <laughs> <laughs> but it was enough that we had there weren't people out, so we had the place to ourselves. So it's pros and cons, right? 
you take the crookeds with the straights, you get yeah. less people out, but you get the bad weather. And so mm. I guess another thing that I forgot to describe is even before we go to any property, as soon as we have confirmed and we know that we're going there, we will do a couple of hours of research of just looking at looking on their website looking at other photographers that, that have been there and just looking at all the angles to try to get ideas going in our minds because we like to go on site already having a few, probably 50% of the shots that we think that we're going to do already locked in. And then 50% would be inspiration. More free form. More free form. But if we can't find something, we have a whole, we have so many shots that we've done for so many hotels. We could just do anything. We like to go in prepared and just to to have an idea because again, if we're only there for two days and we want to make sure that we can execute our first collaboration that we did in Brazil, I was just thinking about that. It was so hard because we literally just showed up and we're like, okay, now we have to create this many photos and we have to make a video. Like, what do we do? What even looks good? Like, what do they think looks good? Because their Instagram page didn't look great. So they don't know what they're doing and we're supposed to help them. And we didn't know what looked good. And so we literally sat there and we're just like, I don't know, does that work? I don't know, does that work? And at that point in time, we were shooting with a tripod for all of our shots. So early on, if you scroll down on our account, it's all couple shots, all couple shots. And we took all of our own photos. So we're just going, setting up the tripod, sit on self timer and pop, 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 pop. And then we go like do our poses like, hey, romantic, hey. And then we would go back, check it. Did it work? I don't know. And like five, six, seven iterations of this, Hamilton, we would go and it would just be exhausting. And then we'd get back at night with our photos and just be like, dude, we didn't get anything today. Like this is so bad. But now when we go into a hotel, we're like snipers. We know what we're getting. We shoot individuals and couple shots. And so, yeah, being a few years in, I'm a lot more grateful for the skill set that we've got. I think a big thing, too, for us is when we first started out, you kind of have to try on a lot of different hats of different things that you want to do. So when we first started out, we were doing um, photography for hotels and clients. And then we were also doing our Instagram, social media. We were doing a blog and a website. We were doing a YouTube. We started a vlog. We, we started, started everything. Yeah, we started TikTok. a vlog. And then that's when TikTok came out. And so we were trying to do it all. And it just, it wasn't sustainable. It was taking the fun out of it. And honestly, everything, all of our work was suffering because we couldn't make any of it the quality that we wanted to. And so that's when we had to have a real kind of hard look in the mirror to say, what are the things that we're good at? What are the things that we enjoy? And what are the things that we feel like we can really add a lot of value to our clients? And that's when we cut out YouTube. We cut out or we um, took a step back from the blog to make it less cumbersome and only do very targeted blog posts. And we focus most of our effort into our photography side because that's where most of our income was coming from that's what we really enjoyed that's what we started as photographers so that felt really close to the core and then um social media of instagram and tiktok but we completely cut out youtube but right now our we have a fun meter and if if we're not having fun we're like dude we can go back to our old jobs and not have fun and we can make (laughs) more money than we're making right so like, if we want to do that, then let's just go back to our old jobs. And so if we're not having fun with what we're doing, then we yeah. need to change what we're doing or just go back to our old jobs. And right now we're in Ibiza. We're not at our old jobs. So <laughs> we're having a good time. <laughs> yeah, but what's important that I'm hearing is that, you know, it takes a while to figure it out too. Like you got the opportunity and the inspiration to do it, but to actually really hone the craft. And I really like the this last part that you're describing, like figuring out what you do really well and, and becoming really good at that. And also looking at what ultimately provides the lifestyle that you need and what makes money for you in terms of, you know, instead of all the different things that you could put out there, but that ultimately, like you say, aren't it ultimately the same high quality or it's not your passion or you're not as good. I think that's incredible advice for anybody in today's day and age. Cause like, you, you start to run a, a small business, you're an entrepreneur, you're working for yourself and you look at social media and now there's five, six, seven, eight channels you need to try to cover. 
and they all have different algorithms associated with it and they all have different styles and and a different look and how are you supposed to do that i mean i understand a big brand you know can do it with a content factory and 10 15 people that are working for it and try to cover it etc but for everyone in the in the space that is you know young in it or trying to get going trying to figure out their own way they don't want to just do the corporate job or they even can't and they need to figure out another kind of alternative lifestyle or alternative income needs to hear that you can make it in a niche that you're really good at. You don't have to try to cover everything. It's okay to let some things go and be really good at the pieces that you're really good at. And um, I think that's just incredible advice for anybody. And I think that when you're getting started, you do need to try everything. You need to see all the flavors and take, taste it, feel it, try it on, whatever it is, and then see what doesn't fit. And so we, we had to try all the channels to figure out, hey, I don't like doing YouTube anymore, so we're not going to do that. And we just started a podcast. And so we're like, oh, let's see how this feels. And right now, it's fun. And so we're, we're enjoying it. Of course, like work is work. When we say fun, fun's relative, right? Because fun when I was 16 is different than fun right now. Like I, my idea of fun is like working hard on something and then seeing the fruits of that come to come out and being like, Hey, we're proud of what we just did. That's cool. And I'm excited about that instead of just like goofing off and not working hard. That's a different, different style of fun right now. (laughs) Yeah. But I, I also think it's important that you understand that the fun part for people that comes from within and it's, we're going to be working. Right. Like this is work. You guys, when I met you guys, you guys, you know, you travel is part of your work. And some people, like you say, travel for vacation and that's what it is. But and there's a lot of stress with travel. And there's a lot of, like you said, letting go to the unknown. And there are delays. Like when we were leaving Blue Morpho, there were delays and and there's got to be flexible all the time. And you never know where you're ultimately going to end up, but, you know, you're going to end up someplace. okay, Right. And so, I, you know. You got to you got to understand, like for the people listening, you got to understand that if you're going to be in business for yourself, you know, you're going to deal with a lot of the roughness of life. And that might not be in that moment personally fun. But this overarching concept that you're enjoying it more, that you feel inspired, that you're creative, that, you know, you guys get to use both the analytical nature of your minds and also the creative nature of your mind together. It's a really interesting hybrid. It's not just one or the other. You're also dealing, you're using your business skills to run your own business. Like you guys are a brand and a business in your own right. And, and you're taking that to also be able to travel to amazing places at an age that most people don't get to and amass all of these life experiences, you know, and I could, I could think that a lot of people would be very inspired by what you guys have been able to carve out for yourselves from, you know, where you started. It's funny. There was a meme that I saw one time and it said, I left my nine to five to work 24 seven for myself, (laughs) which is essentially what you're doing. But I think it was really important for both of us to have um, the corporate time before we started working for ourselves because we really get to appreciate it. So there's a lot of times, I mean, it was, um, actually something that was hard for us to grapple when before we went to Blue Morpho to do ayahuasca is the fact that we were off grid for a week and that was the first time that we had been off of social for seven days where we had not been working on our business for the past four years we had literally worked every single day at it which again it's things that are inspiring it's creative but we're working every day. We're constantly checking the emails. I, for every single day of those four years, I was editing some type of photos. Always editing. Always editing some type always. of photos, whether it was for a client, whether it was for our social media, whether it was for stories or something. I was always in it. I was always working at it and I liked it. It was creative, which was a huge gap that I had missing from my old life. But uh, as you said, you you work hard, but it's for something that you're passionate about. It's something that you care about. And again, we knew what the alternative was. And so as we're sitting there on those days when it's really hard, when you know it's midnight and we've told our client that, hey, you're going to have all of your photography edits by the next day. And I still don't have it done. So I know I'm going to be up till 1, 2 a.m. trying to get it done to make sure that we meet the deadline. Those days, it's not exactly fun, but at the same time, I know that that's what I'm choosing that. 
And I would choose it every single time because I love the fact that we get to travel, we get to see these places, we get to do it together, which when we were in our old life, as Davis had said, we barely saw each other. Barely like two or three we hours like a day together. Roommates. That yeah. was on a good day because I was traveling so much. But you were mentally gone. Yeah. You, you come home, your brain was fried. And I had been talking to people on the phone all day and I was we would just sit there and stare at the wall. And then we'd go to bed and then she'd have a conference call with like China at 6.30 in the morning. And then that's actually not an exaggeration. Yeah. Davis literally came home to me staring out the wall a couple of times because my brain was so fried. Yeah, she just couldn't talk. She's like, I just want to watch something. And I'm like, why don't you care about our religion? I mean, it's a whole different thing. But, anyway. but the alternative is super motivating. So knowing where we came from is like, OK, we we can do that if we have to, but we don't want to. So we're going to do this as hard as we can work and we're working harder than we did for our old jobs. And that was still like, we were hustling and we were, we were making it happen back then, but this is a lot more fun for sure. But we love it. And we, it never, we never take for granted how, I guess how exceptional of an opportunity it feels like we have mm -hmm. that we can travel and have this life. It does. It, it feels like, unreal we, it's like we're ice skating in the clouds that's how i think of it <laughs> like that's not even possible but an aya it is possible and that's how it feels we just, just feel so incredibly <laughs> grateful every day <laughs> so i want to go into the ayahuasca experiences you guys had but before we do that to kind of finish this up on the same thread that, that we've been talking about i uh, you know you express sort of the aspect of the marriage and i think for the the couples out there it's, it's incredible to think that you guys are married, you're a couple, you work together, you're traveling together all the time. You know, this is, this is not a picture anymore of like, you know, the normal relationship. So they, I want the relationship secrets. I want you to share, like, how do you keep it going in the relationship secrets for those out there who are like, how is this even possible? Wow, that's, honestly, I think we have a lot to offer in that regard. I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> pat myself on the back. We've worked so hard on our relationship. We It started with therapy. It started with couples therapy. We went to therapy about four or five years ago, and we learned the tools that, and I hated it when people would say that. So let me see if there's a different word. Because before I did therapy, people said, oh, now I have tools to deal with hard conversations. It's like we learned how to see each other and communicate in a way that made sense for us. So we basically wrote our own language in our relationship. Whereas before I was taking my family's language and she was bringing her family's language into this relationship. And we were trying to be like, she's speaking her family, I'm speaking my family. And we're kind of seeing eye to eye, but not really. And then when I realized like, hey, we gotta, we gotta wipe everything out and we gotta build our own language of respect, love, fun. Uh, how do we spend our leisure? Like literally everything and letting our, our families were out of the picture just because we lived in Texas. I think a big no thing too is, again, one of our biggest advice is therapy is amazing and couples therapy, we would recommend to anybody. No shame, no shame. But one of the biggest things that we took away from therapy is that she would constantly question when one of us would say something that felt kind of like an absolute or was a very hard thing of, well, Davis thinks this, or I think that. And she would just gently question, well, what would it feel like if it wasn't that way? Or if, if Davis could know something about you. And she just kind of gently nudged us out of extremes into more of gray area to where we mm. could meet together in the middle. And I think that that's been huge for us as we've gone on and taken on a business together, being together 24 seven, um, taking photos together, which again is sometimes. Oh my gosh, guys, <laughs> taking photos together. And we do this for our job. Every couple is for like, so there's a niche of what we do on Instagram and we meet up with other couples that take photos of themselves with tripods in exotic places. Surprise, there's only a handful of us that really do this. But when we see each other, we all just laugh about like how many fights we get in in these like epic viewpoints. And so there's people there that are like experiencing it on their vacation. And then they see us doing some like really romantic thing. And they're just like, who are these people? And then we start fighting. We're not fighting. It's more like a creative difference. <laughs> We're discussing with, with yeah. 
<laughs> You're discussing the creativity and everything that goes with it. For those who don't know, okay, for those who don't know, professional photography is really difficult to get those images. It's really hard. Really good. It's not, it is, it's really hard. It's, there's so many elements going into it. And sometimes it's very and tedious and unbelievably detail focused. Like I've been in, I've been in a lighting situation where they want me to channel real time, like really deep stuff after an hour and a half of fidgeting. Yeah. Lights. <laughs> so you have like spotlights in your face for an hour and a half. Oh no, not like that. 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 And then they're like, and go. And you have to now real time. Imagine, bring it, imagine, right? this, Hamilton. Like, imagine then if the photographer is like, Hey, I'm going to come and get in the photo with you and kind of nuzzle up into your ear. And we're going to put this on. So then I can go and look at this after two minutes of it clicking. And then we can scroll through and see if we got it. Oh, that didn't work. <laughs> this is in a public area, man. Yeah, like we're talking. Groups. They're taking videos of us. We've been on like the make fun of the Instagram people accounts where they're like Instagrams in the wild or what they call influencers, like, in, influencers the in the wild. Like we've been featured on that. Like, no shame. Yeah. Because dude, we are there creating. We're there for. We're supposed to be there. Like it's our job to be there. You know, like everyone else is yeah. on vacation and we're here just like, hey, we're we're actually supposed to be here. So I'm fine with this. Like you can laugh at me. I'm the one staying for free. Like I'm good. I'm, but going as far as a tip, I, this is something that came up for me is we fight every day, okay? We have disagreements, whatever. Disagreements. We have disagreements. Okay. Fight. Sure. I mean, everyone has their death. There it is right there. See, that's the disagreement and fight right there. The, about the, the word. most that's important it. thing for us has been the small truce. How, what is something that we can offer and say, is there a question that I can ask you simple as what time do you want to eat dinner? Do you want to go on a walk? Uh, how does your stomach feel after that meal? Whatever that, whatever a small thing is that can be separate from whatever we were arguing about. And it allows us to start building again, because when we, when we get in an argument, it's like boom, chaos and we're just wiping everything off, like whatever. And we say things that we don't mean, whatever it may be. But the moment that one of us can come back and say, I'm sorry, I love you, but that's a big step for me, I can say. And I think for you too. But so it becomes a, hey, it's 2 p.m. We have a three o'clock deadline. Let's just move the bullshit aside and let's focus on our work right now. And then we can get on the same side of the table again. And then it kind of brings the shit back up to floating. To be honest, it actually kind of helps that we, to be together 24 seven, that we're also working together because yeah, as David said, if we are disagreeing or having a fight, we'll get an email from a client and we'll have to say, Okay, so the client just emailed. Do we want to do that? In, in, we, we have, have to, to. We have to. We have to work together because we don't have an option. And so I think that's really important. And I would say another really important thing for us in our relationship, and I think every relationship will really have a moment where you're gonna hit a crossroads, and you have to decide in that moment: Am I really in this? Am I in this for the long haul? Am I actually? choosing this relationship because without a doubt there's going to be something that's going to test that and say is x y or z more important and it could be another job it could be the other person's family it could be a friend it could be a dream an aspiration it could be anything but there's without a doubt there's going to be something that's going to test that to say am i in this no matter what and once you can have those conversations and really answer, hey, yes, I am in this, then I feel like there's such a layer of trust that resides between the relationship and between the couple that says, hey, no, we're both in this. And it, who knows when that's going to come? It could come when you're dating. It could come one year after marriage, five years into marriage, but there's always going to be that moment and you're going to be, you know, staring the... Uh, down the barrel of a gun of, am I in this for the rest of my life? What is my answer? And that's a very grounding moment. But once, if you can really say, I am in this for certain, then that for us honestly changed well, a lot. I think that sets precedent because I've stared down the, the barrel of that gun a lot. It happens. It's going to happen. It's like with, with skateboarding, which is what I grew up skating. Like you're always going to have a bad fall but you're always going to have another bad fall. Like you're going to have one and that's going to be kind of the wake up call. And then it's just like, all right, how can I avoid this bad fall next time? But it's going to happen again in a way that you don't see it. And then you have to question it again. It's like, okay, 
Am I in or am I out? And for us, a huge thing has been trust and being able to speak exactly how we're feeling in that moment. Because in a moment, yeah, I'm not in. I'm not right now. I'm going to go for a walk. I'll be back in an hour and let's talk then. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna buy my flight home. I'm not to that point. I have been at that point before. But then, but even that, like I've I may fly home from Morocco, but I will still meet you back in LA. He's and then never we can talk. Away. I haven't flown He's yet. He's never flown away. But there have been moments. It's like, <laughs> see, I think it's important though, Hamilton, that that nothing is off the table as far as conversation. Because yeah. if I, I used yeah. to think like, oh, I can never talk about divorce, but then I started resenting that concept. I was like, well, then I'm, I'm caged. Yeah. I can't do this. I'm, I'm stuck. I, I, I'm, what is this? And I begin hating her because I can't talk about this thing that has legitimately crossed my mind. And for me to trust her with that, and then we've had conversations around it where it's like, that's not something she wants to hear, but it's honestly what I'm going through. And so I'm thinking, okay, how do we talk about this and, and move past if that's the direction we need to go? But that because of our therapy and the years of working together and having really hard and honest conversations almost daily, we've gotten this, this understanding of like, okay, I, this is what I hear you saying. Is this what you really are saying? And it's like, yes, okay. If that's where you're really at, then how do we move forward from here? I would say one last thing of and we have a lot of things we could say about that's like really changed everything for us is boundaries are huge and we have to be responsible for our own boundaries Ooh. so if davis mm. crosses a boundary of mine or if i cross a boundary of his it's my job to inform him that he's crossed a boundary to let him know that like hey that crossed a boundary and then then give him a chance to not cross it again Right. So you give him lots of chances and give him lots and of give you lots. Of yeah. Yeah, give Davis a lot. So he didn't, he didn't as many chances, chances but like in that moment. Right. Cause a lot of times in the moment it can feel yeah. like, Oh, you did this and now victim. I'm now victim. I'm done. Or now you've yeah. done this and, and look at how terrible you're treating me or, or, or whatnot. You, but, you, 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 but yeah, a lot of times what is really hurtful to one person to the other person, they might, they may not see it that way. And so we've had to say, hey, we are in charge of our own feelings, our own boundaries, and letting the other person know when they've hurt us or when they've crossed the boundary, and then giving them the opportunity to say, okay, I see that boundary, and I'm going to respect that and not cross it again. I'm going to try. I'm going to, well, I'm going to really try. And especially in this moment, I'm going to try and not cross it. Or if I do cross it, now I know I am. Right. And I think that, and then, that then there's consequences with that, though. It's that like if you been, cross this, then this is what's this is what I'm going to do. This but that's been huge respond. for us to not build resentment towards the other person. Yeah. Because now if if I'm in charge of my boundaries, then I can't hold resentment towards Davis. If I didn't say anything to him, then yeah. that's my mm. job. That's my own fault for feeling that it way. It cuts out the victim yeah. mindset, which I for me personally, I definitely took on a lot when I didn't really understand hey, I need to set up these boundaries or else I am going to allow myself to become a victim of this type of relationship. When in reality, it's not like she's trying to create this or I'm trying to create it for her. It's literally just like, Davis, you got to put a, a line in the sand and say like, this is where it ends. And from my cultural upbringing and the world that I was raised and her family, we just have different values just by, by being different people. You know, like every, what do they not say? Not like good or bad, right or wrong, just different ways that we'll deal with situations the, i had a, a hairdresser she would say cada cabeza es un mundo every mind is its own world and we cannot like we're not even if we're married we are two separate people and we have to create our own boundaries i don't know what her bound i can't draw her own boundaries for her which i used to do which was savior mentality trying to have that complex and people pleasing i mean there's so many things that i've had to work through and still continue to work through but there's a lot of grace and a lot of just coming back and, and building blocks each day where we're just like, all right, that was messy. Let's move forward. How Let's do we have fun again? When can we have fun again? That's the question. <laughs> She's like, can we have fun now? I was like, yeah, okay. We can. can we have fun again? Yes. Oh, okay. You're going to drop yeah. that and move on to some yeah. fun. On that note, I want to understand, I want to go into your ayahuasca experiences a little bit. Uh, 
you guys came to the Amazon as you know part of your travels. It was an opportunity for you guys to step away a little bit from the work and experience ayahuasca. So uh, walk us through, um, I don't know, what brought you to ayahuasca and uh, what did you get from it? <laughs> what a question. I mean, you know that's loaded. We uh, were changed forever because of it. What brought us to ayahuasca? Uh, podcast, Aubrey Marcus, you were, you went on to Aubrey Marcus podcast and we were listening to his channel and I heard you go on and describe the world that is ayahuasca shamanism in the Amazon. And my mind was blown. I was just like, no way, no way. I had friends that had done ayahuasca and different things, but the way that you described it in not only that one episode, but then I heard you in another episode and then I heard you on another podcast. And I started hearing this world that you had created and getting to know Hamilton as in all these different stories that you were telling on different podcasts. Yeah, we kind of cyber stalked you before we super went cyber stalked. We listened super to cyber every stalked. podcast that you could fit on, to be honest. Well, that first one you say it's so important. It's like you want to you want you can it can go wrong. Yeah. Very easily if you're if you don't know. And being yeah. in Peru and seeing how many ayahuasca offerings there were in each town that we were at, just in this trip when we went down, it's like, oh my gosh, it could easily have ended up in some ceremony where someone was just like doing who knows what. Well, and to be honest, that's where we were kind of on the fence because we heard about ayahuasca about 10 years ago, but there was a lot of mixed reviews about it of experiences and things that had happened. And we had known people and sometimes they had these amazing experiences, but sometimes it was very dark and it was a little bit unsettling and kind of a question. And so that's when we started doing a little bit more research. And when we found kind of the style that you were offering and that you were creating a space that was just there for truth and light and didn't necessarily have the contradiction of dark and light and that polarity that really drew us to the space that you were creating and made us feel really comfortable to go and go into such a vulnerable space like that. So um, we really appreciate that you went on to those podcasts and really talked about your message because I think it's an important one. And I think the space that you are able to create is so unique and it creates such an amazing experience for people to all be able to walk away with something that is life-changing for the better. And a huge thing for me was that you spoke English. Hmm. We had been, we reached out to a couple of different uh, places and the fact that you were the shaman who was administering the ayahuasca and you spoke English, I was like, I'm so fascinated by this, which I think you may recall, I asked you like 10,000 questions going into it. Like, wait, astral conference, what is that? Tell me more. <laughs> How does that actually work? Like, <laughs> give me a plan. I don't, one. I don't want this like, <laughs> oh, this happened. Like, and I read your book and I was like, I want to know like, what did it, what was the smell? What was the taste? Like, how did you feel in that moment? What's going on? And viscerally what's happening. And so I've, I found your story very, very fascinating. And the fact that you're from California also resonated with me because I'm from Los Angeles. And so there was that kind of like this California guy who went down to Peru. I was like, all right, he's all right. You know, he, he probably got a good thing going. <laughs> <laughs> we felt a little bad because when we first went down there, I think after about every meal, we would just sit and pick Hamilton's brain and we would just talk to him for hours and hours. Because so many questions. So many questions. It was so fascinating to learn from you. And that you could speak English, that we could connect with you on that. That was huge. Um, and you just had such an amazing story and just so many years and years of experience that it was just fascinating for both of us. So we booked it like in August to go in November. And when we booked it, we were pretty high on it. We we're like, all right, we're going to go. It's going to be great. We're talking to our friends about it. Like, dude, your life's going to change. It's going to be awesome. We're researching it. And then come November... Our trip to Peru is coming up. We had just come off of a trip to French Polynesia and we were like, we were just, we had a really good trip in French Polynesia, stayed at some incredible resorts. And it's like, now we're going to go. It was like, see, French Polynesia from LA, you just go sideways, right? But Peru is a descent. Like we're going down into Peru and it felt almost like this hero's journey for me where I was like, I am now descending into this, this cave, whatever that is. And that's how it felt in there it was kind of this like very 
uh, I guess I, I wouldn't say constricted, but it was, well, it was definitely a little bit like cold a, because we first went to Machu Picchu. We were shooting for a client. Oh, it was Machu really Picchu. cold in Machu Picchu. So, <laughs> so that's probably a little bit constricting. We things. couldn't breathe there too. So there, there was one night I woke up and I literally couldn't breathe because of the altitude. And so that alone, I think, had my body just viscerally in a, in a tighter place. And then when we got down into Iquitos, we stayed a night there, which Iquitos is not a resort town by any means. And so experiencing that with the internet as slow as it was, which for us is huge. Internet speed when it's constricted is very difficult on our psyche because we have to be uploading so much on a constant basis for con connecting with clients, for streaming, whatever it is. And so that was the beginning of like, oh, like we got to surrender to the Amazon. And when we got onto that riverboat and it's like, all right, no more service, it's gone. It's like, okay, here we go. Like, and I felt, I almost felt it like melting off of me, right? Just, okay, we're in fully, fully covered up in nature. And we've got this gringo shaman who speaks pretty good Spanish and he's got a hold on something that sounds right. And we felt, we felt good about the lodge because we, we've worked with jungle lodges in the past. And so we researched the lodge and we're like, oh, like we could give them a couple photos. You know, that might be something that we could provide for Elconia. But they, they had a really nice operation. And the way that they're, they're doing it, the staff, the eco tours and stuff like that was very nice. So, yeah, when we got there, it was kind of like a, a de-stressing because, again, as we had said, for the past four years, we'd been constantly connected constantly stimulated hyper connection hyper connection yeah. and so honestly for me on the first night that was one of my big struggles and i have come back to and thought about that first night so many times because my first night it was very different from davis's but on my first night um when i got into the vision space i was really excited about it i was thinking, okay, I've got no expectations. I'm just going to let Aya do whatever she wants, whatever this journey is going to be. And I just get into this vision space. It's all dark. And then I see an outline of Aya. She is half woman, half cat. So kind of just laying there and just, you know, the way that a cat will just lay and stare and the, like the tail will just kind of like come up. And she just stared at me for six hours of nothing. And I remember talking to you afterwards about it of, hey, you know, maybe you needed to initiate her. And as you would say that, I would get in my mind's eye a look of her as just like a cat almost like laughing at me like, I know you were trying to initiate, but she was teaching me patience. She was teaching me how to disconnect, to let it melt off. And to be honest, I am used to being in control or if I'm not in control, I'm kind of going to be a rebel and I'm going to go around. I'm going to go around the red tape and I'm going to do it my own way. And she was kind of sitting there telling me like, are you really going to give me control? Because you, you can't fake. You can't do a fake control to me. <laughs> you can't you can, fake me out. You can't fake me out. You can't juke me out in this space. This is my space. So, so, so are you really, are you really going to let me? And so she made me sit there and feel my boredom feel. And, and honestly, it was a great lesson to me just in general of, relinquishing control to the universe, to the timing of the universe of how things are going to play out that, you know, you can sit there and you can bang your head or you can enjoy, enjoy it as you wait. But, um, that was kind of my process of melting down into it, of my first interaction with ayahuasca. And she just kind of sitting there almost laughing at me. I had some purging that first night of, probably purging off the control and the the patience and the boredom, but it was. Do you want to go night by night or just like key takeaways? What it, what do you think will be most helpful? Cause I think key takeaways are, yeah, are good. Uh, Let's go. Through. I would like, we can go on and I would like to do another conversation and go in depth into your guys' experience. I think that'd be, I think that would be really fun. But I think for now, yeah, for now let's do a, a key takeaway. What were like the, the true key takeaways by the, the end of all five nights from it and uh, 
yeah, the most impactful experience. So for me, I've, I've had a meditation practice going into it and I've been able to kind of connect into my body and I had connection with my guides and other spirit type teachers and stuff like that through my meditations. But when I got in, there was one night when I ended up, uh, I left my body. My body was like, had turned into this. It was, it just became like earth. It was like a pile of dirt and it was there. And I was like, okay, my body's there. It's completely at rest. Like all of my organs are completely at rest. And then my consciousness came up and started flying around and I started talking to your consciousness and your body was running the ceremony. And I, and then our consciousnesses were like flying little jellyfish over here. And I was like, Oh, okay. I mean, we're just going to roll with this. And so I started asking questions like, how is this? Like, what, is, like, why do you do this? What is, what about this? And I was like, you, and I realized in that moment that you coded your body to run this in, in Excel. There's this, this coding called macro where you just run a code and it just goes automatically. And I saw in that moment, my understanding of what was happening was that your body had a ceremony that you had coded into it. And then I realized the greater picture is that we all have coded our bodies into functioning the way that they are. And they're, they're actually running unconsciously while our subconscious can be doing whatever if we're, con- if we're aware of that. But otherwise, we've been coded by society and everyone's expectations into doing things that we think are the right thing that make us a good husband, brother, son, employee, whatever it is. And in that moment, I spoke to your consciousness and I was like, is this, is this actually happening? Like, is this real? Like if I come to you tomorrow and I talk to you about this, are you going to tell me that it, like this actually happened, that our consciousness is talking? Cause like in that moment, my body's just on its back on the ground mouth, like completely just unmoving. And then you're there like, nay, 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 nay. And so I'm thinking, okay, either I'm going to lose my mind and be absolutely insane after this, or this actually happened. And you said, well, in, in that moment, your consciousness communicated to me and said, well, you can ask me tomorrow and we'll see what happens, but does it even matter if my physical body remembers it or not? Because this is happening right now. And I was like, oh shit, like this is happening because I'm, this is happening. Like I'm, I'm talking to this consciousness that is Hamilton consciousness and his body's over here doing the ceremony. And so then after I come back into my body at the end of the ceremony, I'm having this whole dilemma in my head. I'm like, either I like nothing matters anymore and I'm, and I've gone crazy. And I just, if this did happen, then what, what am I doing on this planet? Like, what's my purpose? Because this, I've never experienced this in my life. And that moment also, when I was flying in that consciousness realm, I saw all these other consciousness of enlightened beings and they're just like, yeah, this is what it is, man. Like, this is, this is it. And this is like the eternal now and it's awesome. And we're all flying around. And I was like, okay. So then all the things I learned growing up about religion and all this stuff, it's just, no, this is what it is. And so the next morning I was scared because I didn't want to come talk to you and look like a crazy person. Cause I honestly like was debating if I was certifiably gone. And so I come up to you and I'm like, maybe if I just stare him in the eyes, he'll like read my mind. You know, I don't know. Like, I don't know what level of shaman or magic he's at. And so I grab your hand and I'm like, did that really happen last night? And you're like, what do you mean? And I was like, was I, were we, you know, and you're like, oh yeah, you were flying around here. And then we were talking over here and doing that. I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe once that happened for me. And I don't know if you even remember that happening, but like to me confirmed yeah. that like, okay, I, I'm in, let's go. And the next, the following nights, I just let go. Cause the first night I really was trying to like take notes mentally. I was almost trying to take notes in English and it was too slow for the the downloads that were happening. And then the rest, the the next three nights, I was just like, here we go. I'll just listen to the Icaros and let's just fly. And so all these things just started flying at me. And I was just like, we'll get it later. We'll get it later. We'll get it later. And that connection that I have with you in that conscious space was that proved to me that this was this was happening this is real and that there's there's truth in this 
Yeah, Davis definitely had that a was, different experience than I had. I was as wow. I was sitting there in the void, staring at my Aya the cat. We come back and compare notes, and she's like, "What the? Hell? Oh, no. <laughs> you gotta go fly around with his shaman consciousness, and that's what you're staring at this cat. Like, what's going on? <laughs> I don't know. I just I ended up there. I don't know. For me, my takeaway. So my first, I had about. Um, I had two nights that were very similar to that. And it was really, or three nights really, but my last night was where I got most of my big learnings happened on my fourth night, which I'll be honest, when I was going in there fourth night, I was like, I don't know if I can take this again. It, Cause it was just the, the nothing. And, and I was trying, I was trying so hard to try to make something happen that it took until my last night where I was so exhausted from the trying where I just said, I don't even care anymore. I don't, whatever. I'm just, I'm going to drink it and I'm just going to lay there and I don't even care if she shows me anything at this point. I'm just tired. And that was of course, when I was finally had so exhausted that I wasn't trying anymore that then slowly the vision started to come and they started to, I started to find meaning in them because I wasn't trying so hard to find the meaning. I was just letting them unfold. And then I was just more watching them. And I had some really beautiful moments of being able to reclaim parts of my heart and parts of my love and uh, self-worth. And, and I've honestly, I've, I've been able to hold on to that of so much before I've been incredibly hard, incredibly critical on myself my entire life. And I was able to reclaim parts of my heart and soul in that experience that has been able to give me a little bit more grace. And I was able to find the enjoyment and just the sheer pleasure in it of um, I actually, there was quite a few times when spirit animals would come and there was a period of about, I don't know, 20 minutes or so where I was just on a dragon flying around just for the pure pleasure of it. I wasn't trying to find meaning, right? Because I had gone through three nights of trying to find so much existential meaning to where I just said, hey, there's a dragon. I'm going to ride around and I'm just going to enjoy this in my eye of vision space. And that's enough. Um, and I think it was really powerful for me that that last night was really everything for me. And it was when I had kind of broken me down enough to where I was really letting her have control. I was letting the universe have control. And I was just sitting there experiencing, enjoying, and having a little bit more grace and love. And one thing that I, I mean, there's so many takeaways from it, but I think that's coming up for me right now in this moment is I felt unconditional acceptance and love from Aya mm -hmm. for my communication with her throughout those four nights, she was there and I could act and do and say anything. And I just felt her there giving me love. She gave me a lot of love and so many just like advice, uh, advice, so many advices. She gave me so much <laughs> advice and just so much care. She, she offered so much comfort and it, I felt that it was not with any ulterior motive. It was just, she's like, I just want to do this. And I have never experienced that. It was pure altruism, I guess would be the, the right word. And I've never experienced that in humankind. Like I just, I didn't, I've heard of it like, oh, God loves, Jesus loves us. This is how it works. It's like, I've never actually felt that until I was in those, those moments with her. And I felt her true, unconditional acceptance and love for everything I was bringing to the table. Cause I, I didn't even have an opportunity to have a mask with her cause she just saw straight into my soul. And she saw, that's what she saw was my light. And she's like, this is just who you are. Like, and I like, I like that. And I want to say these things to you because I want to do that. Not because I'm trying to manipulate you. I'm not trying to get you to do something for me. It's literally just because that's what's coming through. And that, that, that honesty was, something that I've never experienced before. Yeah. And I think another um, huge thing for me was at, in conversations afterwards, when we would talk to you, you would say, Hey, you know, maybe think about, you know, asking the space to bring in love, to bring in God, to bring in universe, to bring in consciousness, all of these things. 
And as I had mentioned in um, a couple of my nights, I was sitting there in a void that felt like just eternal blackness of nothing was there. And it was a big aha moment for me that I actually didn't get until a couple months afterwards when I was trying to call in all of these things, thinking that they weren't already there to begin with, thinking that that God, that spirit, that consciousness isn't there in the in-between, isn't there in the the gaps, the void, the darkness, that it's there in all aspects of life. And it was just kind of a, a big aha moment for me of almost laughable as it's almost like I was sitting there in an ocean calling for water to be brought in. And so... Um, that was a, that was a big aha for me just throughout life that universe spirit, God, whoever we want to call it is always there. Yeah. I think that's unbelievably fantastic. Um, how can people find you? How can people, uh, connect with you? We have a website, sydneyanddavis.com. We have an Instagram channel, at Sydney and Davis with one D. If you look there, you will find our, all of our photos or photography work. We just started a podcast also called life with Sydney and Davis, where we talk through what's going on with us this week. We feel like we've had a, a, quite a few people ask us just like, Hey, what are your days like? Because our life is different. We have a different uh, life that we live and we have some pretty funny stories that happen to us honestly every day. And so we share some of those funnier moments on the podcast, a little bit more of a, kind of feet are kicked up, relaxed vibe. And if you guys have any questions, shoot us a DM on Instagram and happy to connect there. Amazing. Thank you so much, Davis and Sydney. It's such a pleasure to have you on the Blue Morpho podcast. I look forward to another conversation with you and where we can unpack all of those experiences with ayahuasca. And so thank you guys so much for Sounds being here. Sounds good, Hamilton. We'll talk soon.